Metal Gear Solid 5 represents the culmination of a one year journey for me, playing all of the main Metal Gear Solid titles as well as Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. It also represents the end of Kojima's journey with the franchise, having walked away during the development of this game after a breakdown in relationships with Konami. Konami finished the game and released it almost a decade ago now, it's crazy to think how long it's been, and what we ended up with, to me at least, was one of the most fantastic, confusing, hilarious, aggravating and downright brain numbing experiences that I've ever encountered. Now before we begin, it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, what is coming up in this video will 100% contain story spoilers as well as an in-depth analysis about the mechanics of the game. So if you haven't yet played this game, but you still want to, I would, uh, I would suggest not watching this. So go play it and uh, then come back. I'll be, I'll be here waiting. Off you go. I'll wait. Given this game is rather large, I'll try and keep this video as succinct as I can and break it down for you. So we'll go through my overreaching thoughts, or overarching thoughts I should say, then go deeper into the gameplay uh, before giving my verdict on the story and then my overall thoughts on the game. So grab a drink, sit back and relax as I welcome you to my review of Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. Now very seldom these days do I have the time or the desire to sink my teeth into an experience that will last beyond the 20-25 hour mark. So when presented with this game which was sitting around the 40-60 to 60 hour mark, it is perhaps no surprise that it took me the thick end of four months to complete this. But let that not be a criticism on the game itself, let it instead be a damning indictment of my time management skills and my busy personal life. This game was by and large a very enjoyable experience, providing me with some of the most brilliant stealth action gameplay sequences that I've had in any video game that I've ever played. But to say that this game is purely a stealth action game would not only be a disservice, it would be an outright lie. The freedom that this game allows you when you're approaching your missions is, is mind-boggling. You can, you can go gung-ho and, and play it as if you're cosplaying John Wick. You can sit from a distance and pick people off as if you're playing Sniper Elite 5, just maybe without the devastating slow-mo kills. Or, if you wish, you can roll up in a tank and obliterate anything that moves. And the best thing about all of these choices is that I often found myself jumping between certain playstyles during the same mission. Sometimes because opportunities to have fun kind of presented themselves to me, but often, at least in my case, uh, because something happened which sort of forced me down another playstyle entirely. Now, whether it be because the silence had broke, uh, the weather changed and a giant sandstorm rocked up, allowing me the opportunity to get in and do some CQC, whether it was being detected or perhaps a chopper turned up and cut off my route to a certain building or wherever I needed to get to. Whatever it was, whether it was the weather or whether it was my own substandard attempts at being stealthy, every mission felt unique and important in equal measure from a gameplay perspective. This is despite the fact that primarily the vast majority of missions were pretty similar. Select equipment, select your buddy, Select a landing zone, select the time, infiltrate the AO, blow something up, eliminate someone, rescue a prisoner, and then escape either by horse, vehicle, or by chopper, and escape off into the sunset. Now, to be completely honest, this alone for me would have been almost enough on its own to set up a truly fantastic game. But no, this has got yet more depth. The research and development branch of this game is frankly mind-boggling. The sheer amount of weapons, upgrades, items, tools and gear that you can unlock throughout this playthrough is astonishing. During my playthrough, I barely scratched the surface of what was on offer in the R&D department. Instead, I ended up kind of just playing with the same stuff over and over again because it was kind of tried and tested and I enjoyed the certain weapons I was using. But as and when I do go back to playing this game again or playing a new playthrough entirely, I would 100% want to try out some new stuff. I mean, this all sounds brilliant, right? Well, believe it or not, there's more. How about some base building elements? How about some staff management? How about some buddy unlocks and skills? Yep, they're all there as well. Although maybe not quite in such a deep way, but still meaningful enough that they require your attention. There is a multiplayer mode as well. <laughs> it's just so much. And it's apparently still alive and working. I didn't actually try it myself. Um, but it's basically a mode where you kind of raid each other's bases, which is filled with AI weapons and booby traps that have been selected by the opposing player. And I think you have to get to like, the center to steal a nuke or shut down the computer or whatever, whatever the objective is. It is still alive almost 10 years after the game released. Or how about a giant mech developed by Otacon's father that they tell us is so freaking cool because you can drive it around and cause mayhem with it. Sounds awesome, right? Yeah, I thought so too. The game is sprinkled with utterly mental and magical moments. Some fantastic dialogue and cutscenes, even if there aren't enough of them. Memorable characters and a device that allows you to extract goats seemingly to the International Space Station. 
This game seemingly has it all. The gunplay is exquisite. The graphics still look amazing 10 years on, trumping many newly released titles to this day, and it runs flawlessly with almost no performance drop-offs that I can remember. And that's playing for 46 hours during this game. I genuinely cannot remember a single moment where this game stuttered or had a FPS drop or any of that. The fantastically intelligent and tough AI that we've kind of grown to associate with this series also make a, a welcome return. They offer a, quite the challenge, but they're not ridiculous throughout the game. Um, I personally feel like they toe the line really well between fun and difficulty uh, and making each engagement feeling quite different and, and quite unique. And you may have noticed that so far in this review, I've not yet spoken about the story. Well, there is a reason for that. The story in Metal Gear Solid 5 is practically the only part of this game which gives me the most mixed feelings. Now, the trouble is, in Metal Gear Solid games, the story, the dialogue, and the lore of the game is largely what sets it apart in the world of video games. Coming off the back of the interactive movie that was Metal Gear Solid 4, I wasn't all that sure what to expect with this. I'd heard that Kojima and Konami had gone their uh, separate ways and had their breakup, but I'd no idea how that would impact the game itself. But what I had heard is that many outlets called this game a masterpiece. It got huge ratings, it sold really well, um, but I'm guessing that all of that wasn't purely down to the story. The story, frankly, is a convoluted bag of puzzle pieces that never quite seem to fit together as they should. Set nine years after the events of Ground Zeroes, the story follows Venom Snake as he goes in search of revenge for the attack on Mother Base at the climax of the previous game. The nine year gap for our hero is spent in a coma and the game begins in a hospital where a failed assassination attempt has you scrambling to escape. Here we see the first and frankly most crazy sprinkling of that Kojima class A drug infused magic that we have come to know and love over the years. We meet the man on fire, a young psycho mantis, a giant flaming blue whale and a flaming horse all flying through the sky. And all of that is just in the first hour. The main thread of the story follows a man called Skullface who we spend a great deal of time trying to unravel his plans. And eventually we work out that he planned to release a deadly parasitic weapon around the world. Along the way, we meet Huey, Otacon's weasel of a father, a child soldier called Eli, who we later discover to be a young liquid snake. And we are reunited with Ocelot and Miller. Then of course there is Quiet, a mute sniper with a very, interesting outfit choice. But if I talked you through every single aspect of this story, I would make this video comfortably well over an hour long. So instead, I'm gonna kinda of go through this at a high level and give you a few key reasons why this story didn't really resonate with me across the playthrough, despite some fairly big and cool twists towards the end. The first one is the cassettes. Now, this is a big one. Gone are the codec calls that we got used to in the early entries in the franchise and replaced instead by cassettes of recordings. Now, for the most part, this change is not a biggie. Replacing the codec calls is, though, a very big call as it's kind of iconic in the Metal Gear series. And that's coming from somebody who hasn't grown up with these games and loved them for, you know, 20 odd years. But replacing them with a different method of delivering the same information in much the same way, I guess, it's sort of fine in principle, but it did kind of present two issues for me. The first is that with the codec calls, they all felt succinct and they were for the most part integral to the story in which you were playing in whichever Metal Gear game it was. They always had important dialogue. It was always necessary to push the story forward. Yes, you could make calls yourself and you could have side conversations that gave you some more lore here and there, but effectively the game gave you what you needed when it needed to. And with the cassette tapes, you're given so many across the game that they become tiresome towards the end. And they're often not pivotal to the story, it's still important in some cases, so you do feel compelled to listen to them just in case you might miss something by ignoring it. But there is no doubt that they lack the impact that the codec ones had. These are, for the most part, purely informational, often talking about things that have already happened as sort of a catch up and maybe filling in one or two blanks. It almost makes you feel like the game is standing still at times, that the progression is halted at the stage in which you're listening to those cassettes. Now, whilst you can play the game and have these on in the background, it just doesn't feel quite right to me. It feels like you should be giving these things your time um, just in case that you miss something important to the story. The game obviously wants me to hear them, right? So why would I distract myself with a side mission and risk not hearing anything? In my opinion, what they should have done is had the cassettes purely there as like a lore binger, extra information about certain topics, and they're purely as an optional extra if you want to go and kind of, you know, learn more about a particular subject. Then all the critical points are delivered via cutscenes, and this would just make the cassettes, I don't know, just matter more, I guess? because it would ensure that nobody misses out on anything. I would imagine that there is a 
pretty large percentage of people that played this game that did not care for these cassettes. So they would have missed out on some very cool conversations. And there were some, I'm not saying that there were none at all, but because of the fact that they were interspersed with so many ones that really didn't add a great deal, people would have switched off. And I think that they, they screwed up on that one. And it also doesn't help that there was almost no back and forth with Snake in these cassettes at all. And this leads to the second big problem for me. No David Hater. For nine entries in this franchise, we've had David Hater's gritty tones in our ears. So not hearing him was quite the surprise to me. Now digging into the reasons for this, it would seem that Kojima had long wanted Hater out. According to various articles I found when looking into this, it would appear that Hater had to uh, auction for the role of Snake as far back as Metal Gear Solid 3, when apparently he actually wanted Kurt Russell to do the voice of Snake. Perhaps Kojima didn't have full control over who was the voice actor the English voice actor at that point, but Kojima did say that the main reason behind having Keith Sutherland uh, as the voice of Snake is that he wanted to take Snake in a new direction. For most, this raises eyebrows as the Japanese voice actor remained the same, so perhaps there was more to it. I, I don't know. Some have speculated that he wanted Keith Sutherland for his ability to act more with facial expressions as well as his voice. Who knows? Sutherland does a great job with his lines. It's just there's not enough of them. Um, so one could argue that this whole hater is a mute point anyway. Throw in the apparent financial issues that were also apparently a big reason why the game in many people's opinion was left in an unfinished state. And maybe perhaps that's why Snake doesn't really talk a great deal across this game. But not having the back and forth with main characters, not hearing Snake's voice all that much gives you a sense that you're being talked at, not talked with. And I also really miss the random quips and humorous lines that we would see in previous games as well. The humor was arguably so out of place in those other games anyway, but it sort of became synonymous with the game that among all of the attempts at making a really serious espionage thriller of a video game, that it was sort of interspersed with the random funny moments or mechanics that just felt so out of place, but they were still brilliant. I mean, we all remember the bare-ass guard in Metal Gear Solid 1. The fact that you could kill the end in Metal Gear Solid 3 simply by not playing the game for a week, at which time he dies from old age. The various bowel issues of Johnny in Metal Gear Solid 4 and his various fa other family members from other games. Or in fact, that even at the start of Metal Gear Solid 3, the game pokes fun at itself by having Raiden start up in the second game just to wind you up because he knew about the uh, the backlash from having Raiden as the main playable character for Metal Gear 2. The funny moments in this game, in Metal Gear 5, come mostly from more unintentional comedic creations, I guess you could say, that come from the open world nature of the game. Perhaps this is all part of a big trade-off that you get when you have a big open world game. But when the cutscenes did happen, they are for the most part really, really good. Voiced incredibly well and they did a great job of building suspense and excitement. There's just not enough of them and that's kind of it. That's the, that's the long and short of it. Some of the cassette tapes could easily have been cutscenes and it would likely have done a far better job of keeping people interested in the story as well. Mission variety to push the story on was questionable at times. Um, the big story centric missions were often very, very good as they had great cutscenes to go along with them, but others where you're just kind of sent to extract people or just blow something up and then leave. The cycle was repeated a bit too often and towards the end of the game they started to get a bit repetitive for me. As the game progresses on and moves towards a climax, we get several big reveals. But in what seems to be quite a recurring theme with this game, many of them seem a little bit too quick, ill thought out, and in one or two cases borderline quite disrespectful, I feel, to the main character that they're talking about. Quiet, for example, is an absolutely brilliant buddy to take on missions. She is incredibly useful, often bailed me out in firefights, I mean some of my chat even called her OP, but her character is always one of intrigue, never saying a word, Miller looking for any excuse to kill her despite saving Snake on more than one occasion, and although I didn't pick up on it originally, she is actually the one who tried to kill you right at the start of the game while she was working for Skullface as an elite XOF assassin. The injuries that she she sustains means that she undergoes extensive treatment which results in her, among other things, inheriting superhuman abilities at the cost of having to breathe through her skin, which is the game's way of explaining her scantily clad attire. Then in the final hour or two we get a couple of big reveals about why she is a mute, what her original intentions were, and then she sacrifices herself to save us before never being seen again. Whilst the arc of the character is fine and her heroic sacrifice is a cool way for her character to die, albeit quite a sad one, it just felt like it could have been fleshed out and paced a bit better in the run up to that. They could have maybe stretched out that storyline over like an, the final hour or two, maybe longer in the final part of that game. She was such a cool character for her to just kind of disappear like that. 
was as equally sad as it was frustrating to me. Huey and Eli, especially Eli, also had what felt like to be continued moments with their stories and they never really were concluded. I guess with Eli, his story does go on in the future because we know that in the other games in the franchise he becomes liquid, but still to have him steal Sir Halanthropus along with Psycho Mantis and then just disappear off into the sunset and it never be concluded outside of the episode 51 stuff that I reacted to in a separate video is utter madness. The biggest reveal, of course, is saved for the end. We are revealed to be the medic from the chopper at the end of Ground Zeroes. We are not Big Boss. We have to replay the entirety of the first mission again. What a crock of shit that was, by the way. Before it is revealed that Big Boss escapes to continue his mission elsewhere, whilst we take on the persona with the plastic surgery given to us by the doctors to revive and rebuild under the new name Diamond Dogs on Mother Base. Now, this was hinted at several times throughout the game, Apparently, <laughs> I didn't pick up on it, but apparently it was. I have several issues with this overall. When some or much of the story or story elements ride on the fact that people, or at least the medic in this case, hallucinate quite a lot, it feels a little cheap. And by that, I mean the opening of the game is, of course, not really what happens. We know that because we replayed the entire mission again and we see what really happened. So you're therefore able to build an entire story for 40 odd hours or however long I played it for, practically do anything you want because you can just fall back and go, oh yeah, that didn't happen. Even then, it still wasn't finished because episode 51 was made by fans, I think using unfinished material that have been dug out from the game's files. And apparently it was meant to be a DLC, a, an attempt to create a proper ending to the Eli side of the story. And from what I've seen of episode 51, it looked pretty cool. So how Konami never thought to release this is, is, is puzzling, especially after the fact that Metal Gear Solid 5 commercially did very, very well. I mean, there are still so many other things that I haven't talked about. The, the mental drawn out saga with Paz, culminating what appeared to be yet another hallucination which has caused theories left, right and centre on the internet about what actually happened. You've got the different Ocelot we see in this game compared to the others, voiced by Troy Baker. And then there is the overall craziness of the main story with people like Volgin making it as a return as Sauron. Oh, Jesus, I'm getting a headache just remembering it all. The game felt like it just went on a little too long, I feel. Missions felt like at times they repeated a little bit too often before they literally do repeat themselves towards the end of the game. The objectives themselves are a little bit repetitive and the ending of the game felt like a little bit of a relief to a degree even if the gameplay added a, a really good level of unpredictability and uniqueness to the missions themselves it just felt like there was more here they could have done with it with the story overall now that being said the mission on mother base where everyone is infected and you have to go through and end up killing most of your own people that was an absolute banger that was an absolutely fantastic mission and there were other really really good missions throughout the game as well but you have to ask yourself especially that final one where you're on mother base doing that where were missions like that for 10 to 15 hours previous to that? You know, the, the really strong, memorable missions were were too infrequent, in my opinion. Too frequently, the game would have a great mission with great story cutscenes to go with it, pushing the story on and revitalizing interest in the story before then interspersing it with the same tired, repetitive missions, dampening that excitement. And also, I've just played 46 hours as an imposter. I want to be... Big boss, goddammit! I think the sheer amount of progression and depth in the game means that the game had to go on longer because you'd, have, you'd never unlock half of the stuff if you didn't. But the gameplay does do a really good job of allowing it to remain fun and engaging for the most part. As I said earlier, the ways in which you can approach the missions, the different weapons, etc, etc. There's still a lot of fun to be had here, so I don't, I don't want you to think that I'm dogging on this game too hard because I still did have a really good time with this for the majority of the game. Well, that just about covers all the feelings I have on the story. Mm. Holy shit, that was a slog. To sum up this game, it's a really difficult thing to do. The gameplay in Metal Gear Solid 5 is truly some of the best I've ever experienced. The seamless transition between the stealth and all guns blazing, the choices that you have on how to take down enemies and outposts from using decoys, sleep mines, putting C4 onto like power generators to disrupt any potential counterattack that the enemy might try and stage. It's, it's staggering and I totally understand why people adore this game and go back and play it again and again. But then you flip the script over the story is such a mishmash of fantastic cutscenes, engrossing and engaging storytelling, and just flat out boring, listless and lifeless cassette tape filler missions that don't add anything to the game. The pacing feels off and some characters don't resonate perhaps as much as they did in other Metal Gear games, Ocelot being the main one. I don't think I've ever played a game that evokes feelings 
like this one does. How can I quantify and summarize a game that has me so gripped in one hand, excited to go out on missions, progress mother base, and unlock new stuff? And then on the other hand, asking chat, do I need to listen to this cassette tape because I can't be asked to listen to code talker drone on about the parasite again for another three or five minutes. So here we are then, at the end of my Metal Gear Solid journey, a year after beginning it, now for the final entry Metal Gear Solid 5, my verdict is that, I think this is the best way I can really describe it, it is a 9 out of 10 game wrapped in a 5 out of 10 story. There were some parts of this game where I truly felt like I was playing a Metal Gear Solid game. You know, the bit where Quiet snipes the pilot out of the jet as it's coming towards us. The various bits with her Salahanthropus. <laughs> I didn't say that right at all. The various bits with Salahanthropus were all great, but then I'd be lost in a game where I'm extracting sheep listening to cassettes for 15 minutes and doing boring filler missions. From a gameplay perspective, this game should be a blueprint for any game out there about how to do open world properly. Incorporating so many aspects into one fantastic package. Given this game is almost a decade old, the number of open world games that I can think of that provide the same level of fantastic gunplay, AI difficulty, with a deep R&D tree sprinkled with a small element of basic base building and staff management, and I think you could count games like that probably on one hand. I mean, there's been many games out there that have done one or two of those aspects really well, but I don't think there's been many that have done all of those as well as this game has done. It stands up in 2024 in a way that the vast majority of games this age simply don't. And quite frankly, if this game had nailed the story and we had not seen it release in a state where certain parts of the game were clearly not finished, it would arguably be one of the greatest video games ever made. Well, there you go, everyone. That is the end of my Metal Gear Solid journey. It's been fantastic this year playing these games. Um, there may well be another video or two where I do some sort of ranking of the games themselves, the characters within or something like that. Um, so if you guys would like to see me do something like that, then make sure you let me know in the comments down below. Thanks to everyone who came along for the ride throughout my time with this series. I'm very excited to get my hands on the uh, Metal Gear Solid 3 remake. Is it Metal Gear Delta, isn't it? What's next for me? Well, a big break uh, from big ass games, first and foremost. Um, Death Stranding, Unmetal, Kingdom Come Deliverance are all ones that have been on my radar. Uh, for the last month or two, especially with people telling me in chat to play Death Stranding. Uh, but whatever I play, I will give you my word that it won't take me four months to finish it. Um, although that does seem a bit dangerous for me to promise such things. So, there we are. What are your thoughts on this game? Metal Gear Solid 5 has split opinions across the fan base for a long, long time now, for almost a decade. So how does it stack up in this series for you? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Uh, leave a comment down below, as always. Keep it respectful. There's bound to be some disagreement here on this one. That's fine, but just keep it respectful. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. So make sure you leave a like. Make sure you hit that sub button. And all that is left for me to say is have a great day. Stay safe. And I'll see you all on the next one.